Hello and welcome to Retech and today um, I've got a bit of a little confession to make. You may have seen a small micro which has been sitting in the background for a while and that micro is this one here, this Acorn Electron. Now this Acorn Electron hasn't been used for you know, for three years now. I think um, the last time I actually used it was for a just a quick overview video for this channel and that was a long long time ago and um, I'm not sure why because I've got a, a bit of an affinity with the old Electron one because it was something I used um, throughout college and it was one of the first machines I actually blew up and I had to spend another 10 or 11 hours fixing it because at the time I was kind of into video and I was trying to build a kind of jury rig genlock system to work with this but while I was doing it um, I actually put the wrong amount of voltage through to the machine because I was building something on breadboard to make it work and it, it kind of um, fried the regulator etc so it's um just one of those things in it was one of the kind of learning curves that you go through now the reason i was using an, an elk or an electron was because they were relatively cheap when you compare them to the bbc the bbc would have been so much easier to do what i was trying to do with it but costing a lot more money I mean, when you're looking at around about £400 at the time, you know, suddenly um, making a mistake and blowing up an electron, which you could pick up for £100 at one point, didn't seem too big of a deal, you know. So it was just one of those learning curve kind of things. So I eventually got it done. And then that's how I kind of got a little bit of a soft spot for the Acorn Electron and in the past few years I've barely used it and this video is to kind of follow up on my Spectrum one really because that one where I just went through the machines um, to find out what was working what wasn't and you know and found out that a lot of the capacitors really would show up the machine as faulty if you didn't let them charge so basically just leave them on for a little bit to make sure all the capacitors get some juice back into them etc but this is even worse because this has been sat for a long time and um, now it's kind of internally corroding it sounds a bit weird but it is and that's why I've decided to do something about it and as you can probably see in a moment the condition of this machine is not good and it's one of the machines for some reason I've forgotten about I hadn't done much with and you can tell and it's time to put that right so let's take a look at this little acorn electron and uh, see what I found wrong with it and then see what we can do to correct it so if you take a look at this acorn electron the first thing you notice it's pretty filthy it's not sure if it's yellowed i don't think so because it's too uniform across the keys etc which is quite nice it's just filthy it's got a few little nicks and marks where the mucks gathered in them and so on and it's just not in a very nice state but you know cosmetics aside they're the easy bit to kind of put right it's just a case of cleaning it and then making sure it's all nice and workable again but this machine has a few faults and they've kind of accrued since the machine's been sat there since the machine hasn't done anything and you wouldn't really kind of expect it because you know they're not stored outside they're not stored in damp areas they're not stored in anywhere other than somewhere quite nice for these machines but they still get issues and the issues creep into them and then eventually they'll fail and then eventually they won't do anything but but this machine's at a point where it's on the edge and it's on the edge of kind of falling over a cliff and if we don't do something about it now then this machine's not going to survive much longer and which is a shame so i want to try and get this machine put right it's one of the machines I've had for the longest and it's got quite a little bit of history behind this actual machine as well obviously personal history and so on which um, I kind of alluded to at the start of this um, program but we'll try and get this machine put right so 
let's take a, a quick overview of the machine first and then we'll get stuck into the problems. Well, anyone not familiar with the Acorn Electron will probably not know that. Um, it's basically a cost reduced BBC Micro. So it has a lot of the functionality of the BBC Micro. It has one of the nicest proper key switch keyboards. I mean, for a budget machine, they could have just gone down the old membrane route with plastic keycaps, but they kept really nice key switches, which is fantastic. It's really good to type on. It's also very good quality in its plastics as well. It doesn't creak or moan or split or anything, you know, like a lot of the cheaper end plastic cases on some of the micros do. And it's kind of very 1980s with its kind of Tron-esque green on green badge with the white Acorn Electron writing. But the machine itself had a few problems in production. Its main issue was the ULA, the Uncommitted Logic Array. And basically they ran that ULA to its absolute limits. And to a point where it was kind of deemed by Ferranti that um, it wasn't really going to be possible to do, but they eventually got it done. And when we open this machine, because I'm going to have to, I'll just run through that and explain why it's so important to this machine. But for a budget machine as well, it has some nice features. It has obviously a cassette interface, but it has an RGB out as well as an RF, which is fantastic, which means you can use it with cub monitors and also modern-ish screens such as this Sony in the background, which um, has a SCART input. So I've got an RGB to SCART and the picture's really, really nice. But it's fairly basic other than that, as in for ports. It has an edge connector on the back, and that's really about it. So um, we're just going to have a quick look at this machine and we're going to show you what I've found wrong with it. So as you can hear, it's just powered on. So we're just going to bring the camera up. And you can see the screen. You can see how clear it is on a, a screen like this, especially if I just kind of zoom in a little bit just to give you a bit of a clearer picture so to speak and it's very nice with the RGB to SCART and it's very clear but some of the keys are not responding very well so you can go through the entire keyboard and you'll find keys that literally don't do anything so what I'm going to do first off is take it apart and find out why. We know that there are key switch keys in here. So really, I've got a feeling it's just corrosion that's built up through time, which is stopping a lot of these keys from working. So yeah, we really need to try and get this sorted out. It's not on a matrix pattern, so that means the actual keyboard itself is fine as in the electronics part of it, and it's almost certainly going to be the key switches, but we're going to take it apart now and have a quick look. Okay, so the first thing we're doing is just pulling out all of the, the cables. And then we'll flip the machine over and take the screws out of it. And the, that's the edge connector location that I was telling you about. So really, it's not massively endowed with ports. Okay, so once you've got the four screws out of it, you can literally flip the machine over. And we can take it apart. It just lifts off. Now, there is a cable for the keyboard, which is here. And it's, again, it's not brilliant. Okay, it's one of these cheap and cheerful keyboard connectors. So just be very careful with it because that, that is very easy to fracture and then you will have to get a complete new unit because they're very, very difficult 
to repair unless you're going to solder brand new wires and brand new connectors all the way through. So we're just going to take our time with that keyboard. Now as you can see the inside of the electron is very different to most micros. You see that's the biggest component, that's the ULA. Um, and that's basically if you have a look at this machine there's very few components on it. There's probably more resistors pulling values high or low um, than actually ICs and chips etc. So it's, it's, um, this looks like it's quite an early model. It's um, quite small really, the, the circuit board's small. It's not actually that much bigger than the ZX Spectrum but it does have the integrated power supply on this side and you have this power connector here which uh, provides voltage to the edge connector for peripherals that should so that should be really a bit more tucked in between there but it seems to have lifted so there you go um this is the main power to the board itself so you're looking at um, a ula which is there on some models this ula is it is in a massive cage but i've just checked the the date stamp on some of these ICs and it looks like this is an 84 model so it looks like they've modified the ULAs at some stage. I'm just going to have a look see if I can find a revision on this board. Yeah so that makes sense because they, they had to revise the electrons because they were, there was a lot of faulty units going out to customers basically which wasn't a good sign because the ULA was causing problems it was literally failing and um, they basically corrected the fault but again it's not good having machines going out to customers with faults already inherent in them because that's unfortunately that's the way things happen back in the kind of cowboy days of the early microcomputers and when I say cowboy I kind of mean it on a little bit kind of tongue-in-cheek it's like when things are brand new and nobody's ever done it before and you know that the companies are still learning in the same way as um, you know you and I learn when we do something new and that's what was happening it was all new these companies were relatively young especially in the computer industry even the likes of the bigger names at the time such as Commodore was relatively new to the computer market so mistakes were being made and that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of them didn't last as long as people would have hoped but these were the times these were the times these machines were built so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dust this out because we know this works we know the RGB port works we know the power board works we know it's supplying the correct voltage we know by the looks of it it's just the keyboard that's causing issues so we're just going to literally air dust it out and then we're going to do the top of the keyboard as well it's actually quite clean In reality, there's only little bits of soiling really in the entire machine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to dust in between all of the keys. Okay, and that will give it a fighting chance when, when we take it apart. So basically it's quite clean and as you can see from the inside of the machine it hasn't really yellowed which is surprising because it looks pretty terrible really um, but it, it hasn't picked up any yellowing I think I've seen people retro bright these too much and they come out almost white and because if you look at the the two parts there Apart from the dirt, there's not really any difference. So while I'm off camera, I'm going to clean this part, okay? Um, because it's not really fun to watch somebody cleaning a machine. So I'm going to have a quick look at this, lay this ribbon here because 
it's starting to kind of get a few little dents in it which I'm not I'm not happy about so when I put it back together I'm going to make sure it's not resting it looks like it's been resting on top of these pots this little pot here and it's causing a dent in the machine so or a dent in the ribbon cable so through the magic of editing we're going to come back and having this nice and clean okay so with the magic of video you can actually see it's made a lot of difference on the machine itself so the machines actually was quite nice to start it was just dirty so there's no point retro brighting in out and all it needed was um basically an antibacterial wipe over and um a little bit of alcohol ipa just to clean it up a bit so yeah it could do with another quick going over at some point but i'm more interested in getting the machine working so that's what we're going to do now so we know some of these keys aren't working so i'm just going to plug the machine in again put it just leave the top loose and then we'll go over which keys and which keys aren't working and we'll pull each one out okay so we'll show you how i'm going to try and restore this without being too invasive so we're going to connect the keyboard up now Okay, so the old power lead is going to go in, it should just go beep as normal. There we go. And then we'll make sure we've got the screen on. And there's our Acorn Electron. And you can see the return key isn't working. That's why I'm hitting now. Three is sort of ish working. N, no way. We're going to pull the ones that are causing issues now and we're going to clean them. We're not going to use anything other than dust them out and then use a little bit of alcohol on a, a Q-tip because again it shouldn't be invasive. All you want to do is get the corrosion off the pins themselves. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one of the keys and using a little key switch puller and because of how tightly together these are some you have to fiddle around with the puller a little bit and then gently pull them off and what I'm going to do is I'm going to air dust them out simply because a lot of the times you, you only need this you only need a can of air duster because what happens is you can blow a lot of the debris and rubbish out of the key switches even on the electron even with their little plastic tops on there and I'm just gonna oh that works I'll show you straight away on the screen this is one of the stubborn keys perfect so the return key didn't work so I'm gonna just clean that one next so we're gonna pop this keycap back on And that works fine. Now so we're going to pull the return key off. So we'll disconnect the power because even though we're just using air dusting initially, taking <laughs> two keys off that time doesn't really matter. Um, it does have a little bit of liquid in it obviously as it because the temperature change causes liquefaction as well so that's got a little bit of rubbish here so if i use this little q-tip and there we go you can see it on the end of there now that was almost certainly causing a problem so just clean around the area trying to be as non-invasive as possible so I might as well do the one I pulled the um, cap off as well and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop the keycaps back on and we're just going to try that key again so we'll just see if the return key works and that seems to work fine so
and the previous keys that we just cleaned seems to work okay. Two and the three, the four, we'll find out if any more keys are working. So yeah, it looks like doing one key at a time like that will actually fix the problem. It's just a case of not being so invasive so quickly because just a little bit of So just a little bit of um, thought and care into it really by using some air duster, using alcohol, IPA, isopropyl alcohol is enough to bring these machines back. You don't have to go down to the degree of immediately stripping them out, jet washing the cases, pulling all the keycaps off and so on. Just do the affected areas, do it one bit at a time so you can actually find out what the next problem is. So if you get, let's say, the return key working, but the the forward slash doesn't, um, you know then you've got a, a definite problem with the matrix or a definite problem with the switch itself. So I've been quite lucky with this because of the years it's been dormant. It still works really well. So I'm just going to finish off with some of this. We're going to clean the entire machine down again. Now it's had a good wipe over and then we're going to just put some games on it and have a look and see what the electron was all about. And this is preventative maintenance. It's not immediately dying in to strip a machine completely down for the sake of it. Remember, inducing faults is very easy if you don't take your time, if you don't do one thing at a time. So if I had a problem where these keys weren't responding even after cleaning which is your first thing you should really do then you can move on to the let's pull a key switch out of the back of the keyboard and replace it if we can get hold of them and so on but if you don't have to do that you keep in kind of the integrity of the machine and the originality as well so so far this machine is pretty much original still it hasn't massively had any major parts replaced in it it's just had a clean and a service and it's brought it back back to life. Okay so all that's left to do is to basically pop in the screws and make sure it's all back to normal. So we're just going to unplug the cables as normal and we're going to pop in the screws. So I hope you enjoyed that look into how to quickly and effectively recommission a micro that's sat around for years without being used and it's all down to corrosion and oxidization on switches and contacts and pins and basically everywhere you can think of within a micro because at the end of the day they're, they're made of metal, the tracks are made of metal, the pins are made of metal, the connectors are metal and you know they do have a tendency to corrode after a while. It doesn't matter how well you try and look after them and I hope you enjoyed looking at what the Electron could do in terms of games as well. It wasn't a bad micro, it was a very good machine but it was late to market had a few issues with the ULA originally and that put a lot of people off initially with buying that machine and it eventually helped with the downfall of Acorn computers at the time. So hope you enjoyed this please subscribe and I'll see you soon. Thanks. Thanks for watching. See you. Bye bye.